Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show today. I'm so excited to have Ryan Naris on the show. Ryan, thanks for being here. Suja, thanks for having me. Awesome. So everyone, Ryan has an incredible story. He started with nothing, no money, no network, and no experience. And now he has bought 20 mobile home parks spanning roughly 1,800 units and growing. So Ryan, that's obviously an incredible accomplishment. Let's talk about, tell us about how you got from zero to 1,800. Yeah, before we even get there, though, I want to tell you that like probably most of your listeners, I bought the lie. I did. I'm a millennial in the United States of America, and I hear it's not just the United States of America, it's other countries as well. They pretty much so tell you, oh, study hard in school, and then you'll go to a good university, and then you'll get a good job, and then you work really hard at that good job, and then guess what? You'll get promoted, then you'll retire on a beach one day. That's not true at all. <laughs> not at all. What happens is you stress yourself out in your teen years to get good grades and you miss opportunities to really socialize and grow and discover who you are as a person by exploring hobbies when you can before you have the responsibilities as an adult. And then you go to college and then you kind of have a chance to pick your major. But as soon as you do something fun, like I did, like I was a psychology major because I've always had a passion for people and how people work. And my own mother asked me how I was going to make money. My wife, she was like, I really want to be a music major. And her dad said, how are you going to make money? So that's kind of how that goes. So thankfully, I was stubborn enough to stick with psychology and basically say, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. But then what happens? Well, you rack up all the student loan debt and then you get funneled into a corporate job that you ultimately find does not fulfill you. It's making the shareholders rich and sometimes having really horrible bosses and colleagues who put pressure on you, whether you realize it or not, to conform. And at the end of the day, whether it's your own mother telling you, how are you going to make money or your own father, it's not that that's coming from a bad place. It's just what we consistently do as human beings is we listen to others intentionally or not, right? Like my mom directly telling me or, or my father-in-law telling my wife directly, how are you going to make money? Is, is not the only way people tell us not to do something, right? It's, it's also the facial expressions, body language, just like these assumptions we make that ultimately all boil down to one thing. It is other people who don't have what we want telling us directly or indirectly how to get what we want. And what ends up happening is over the course of literally decades, you just conform. You find yourself conforming whether, you, again, whether you realize it's happening or not, you just it's just what you do. You just go to university. That's just what you do. You just go and get a job out of college. It's just what you do. Nobody stops to say, well, why don't you take a year off and just go and travel the world and discover yourself? Because you get the, what kind of hippie is this? <laughs> right? Like I bought all of that. I did. I bought all of that. And what it gave me was I was depressed. I was stuck. I was 15 pounds overweight. And I was miserable in my 20s. Like, that's not a way to live. Do you want to look back on your life and be like, how did you spend your 20s? Uh, miserable working for someone else? That's for, No. The right answer was to go back to the drawing board and figure out who I was and what I liked and not what I thought I liked because other people told me directly or indirectly that's who I was or what I was supposed to be or does that make money? No, it, it, it came down to this. I, I knew I liked sell, selling people, sales. And so I went and got a sales job, but at the same token, I didn't realize what I didn't like about selling. And I didn't realize that I had other passions like operations. And you also go on this journey to where you think you're going to like something or you start out hating something and you love it. Like with my business, I thought I was going to enjoy the legal aspects of my business. I really did. It's law is very fascinating. Law is horrible when it's live. 
<laughs> and there are real consequences for losing. Accounting, I hated accounting. I remember the first accounting class I ever had the first night, my wife could hear me in the other room screaming, cussing at the top of my lungs. She's like, is everything okay in there? I'm like, it's just accounting homework. I hate this. I've grown to really enjoy accounting. <laughs> yeah. And it's this long process, Suja, of being brutally honest with yourself. And like Stephen Covey says in The Seven Habits of Highly Affected People, you, you've got to begin with the end in mind. And if you have, if you're going 60 miles an hour in the wrong direction, you are not doing well, no matter how well you think you're doing, because you're going in the wrong direction. Someone who's not moving at all is doing better. So can you just expand really quick on what you, sure. I mean, I, I totally relate to every aspect of your story. What is it that you mean when you say this long process of being brutally honest with yourself? Yeah. Again, over the course of decades, directly and indirectly, people tell you how to get what you want. And these are people who don't have what you want. My dad's a college professor. He's great. I love him to death. If I wanted to be a college professor, he would have amazing advice. I wanted to be a real estate entrepreneur. My dad still to this day jokes that I play with Monopoly money. He is not someone to get advice from on that. And again, it's whether he's like my mom saying, what are you doing getting a psych major? Or someone going, what? You're doing what? You know, or, or just like, this is just kind of the culture and this is just kind of assumed. Whether it's direct or indirect, people affect your belief system. Like you and I were talking about limiting beliefs before you hit record. Other people directly and indirectly say things either with words or body language that affect what you think can and can't be done. And it's just a bold faced lie. And it's not a lie because it's coming from a place of them trying to hurt you. Like my mom wasn't trying to hurt me by saying like, what are you doing being a psych major? My mom was more thinking like, oh my gosh, this kid's going to be a psych major and then he's going to wait tables and he's going to have all the student loan debt. That's a very, generally speaking, good thing. But what she was wrong about and what I think most people who want to be entrepreneurs need to understand is that you've had literally decades of people very close to you giving you bad advice and you just don't, you don't know it. And it, it's not something you let go easily, especially if you double down on your education like I did and went back and got a master's degree. Okay, now I all of a sudden have a lot more student loan debt and I have a house and a mortgage with a wife and now I have a kid, but you know, we wanted kids a couple of years ago. So you just get, it's like quicksand. You just, you get stuck in the mud. And you have to find your way out and it's not quick. Yeah, I, I hear you 100%. Can I just ask what sure. corporate job did you end up getting? Was it even related to psych? Loosely. So uh, out of college, I bounced around. Actually, I had a telemarketing job. I didn't realize was going to be telemarketing because I was totally naive. And then I had to, it was 09. So it was right after the crash. Then I worked for Best Buy part-time just to have a job. And then I worked for Honda. I sold Hondas for four years, loved sales, hated working for someone else. Then I worked for Carnival Cruise Lines Corporate, pursuing an operations and statistics career, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but I realized in time I would probably grow very bored of it. And then I worked for Wells Fargo and banking. And all the while I knew at a really young age, call it 22, 23, 24 years old, I needed to work for myself. And I, I did that by picking up books because I realized that my bubble was really homogenous and really limited. And if I was going to put myself out there, I would need to do more than just network with other college graduates who are in corporate America. I needed to just start reading books. And from there, books like Tim Ferriss, Four Hour Work Week just completely blew my mind. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Seven Habits. I mean, I can list off a whole long list of books that just changed me. And again, it all, it, that's why I say it's, it's not a quick process. There are things that you hold close to your heart. 
that have to be uprooted. And it's really hard. So yes, we are going to talk about real estate and how <laughs> I had no money and how flash forward five and a half, six years later, now I'm literally in my pajamas in my house in the middle of a work day. Uh, well, I'm so glad that you're actually bringing this to light because mm -hmm. it's, it is so important. And, you know, I, I mean, when I often tell my story, like it often starts with, I started with no money. I bought real estate with my student loans. Um, and that's sort of intriguing to people. But the reality is, is what kind of what you're talking about is that actually in order to even get to that place, you have to peel back so many layers of what you've been told your entire life. Um, yes. And so when I did that, I was in a mindset of, and was in an expansion mindset. And it's amazing how that can even get taken away. Cause then at some point I got a little bit, I just was like, Oh, I just want a paycheck. And so then I got into corporate and then, um, and then it's just easy how, how easily it can kind of come back. Those, that sort of like, you know, contractionary mindset, I suppose is one way of talking about it, but. I don't, I don't think it's fair to talk about all the sexy, cool, fun things I've done <laughs> and not yeah provide context like if you watch espn's top 10 you're like wow look at that crazy dunk that lebron james had or the buzzer beater that lebron james had last night and then ignore the fact that he spent years in the weight room watching tape having his body fail him at times and spending millions of dollars on his body to make sure it's conditioned properly like we're just going to ignore all that and go right to the oh wow look i, I wish i could hit a three-pointer like that what, what do I have to do? Can you give me a course, like a step-by-step? -step? And it's like, we, yeah. we can't, I, I want your listener, like I'm happy to get into all the fun, crazy cool things that we've done over the years. But Suja, I feel like for anybody listening in right now, it would be a disservice to not tell you how hard it was to even realize I was meant to be an entrepreneur. And then it took me years to discover mobile home parks. And then it took me years to even get full-time. And then when I was full-time, I was literally full-time living in a mobile home park. So that's how I made my escape with no money is I literally moved into a mobile home park and I lived there for about almost a year and a half. Wow. And, you know, now all of a sudden we can talk about all the success I've had, but it's like, that's not fair at all. Yeah. I you think know? I, I mean, I can totally understand. And when, you know, when we talk about how did you get from zero to 1800, well, actually there's all this stuff that kind of happens before zero. Yes. Right. And I mean, when I think about the making of me as an entrepreneur, I feel like very aligned with what you're saying that the making of me as an entrepreneur was like listening to audiobooks while I was living just like as frugally as possible and doing everything I could possibly do to just cut costs. But I hadn't yet reached that like expansionary mindset, but I was listening to all these books. And it's like, you don't get a handshake in, as an entrepreneur until you've made it right. And so, um, but the making of an entrepreneur, I think often does come, it's not so sexy. <laughs> oh, not at all. And it's nonstop. And the bigger and more successful you get, the harder it gets. That's why when you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, they're like, man, I wish I was back in that basement. Or for me, man, I wish I was back on that blow up mattress in the double wide because it was a lot simpler then. And you have a youthful honeymoon type phase and you grow to love it. I love what I do. I mean, I was talking to one of my investors and best friends today uh, before we hopped on here. And he was like, we're going to do X, Y, and Z over the next five years. And I found myself being like, heck yeah, we are. That's yeah. so exciting. So like, I haven't lost a deep passion for it, but it changes with time. You know, it's kind of like a marriage. When you get married, you love each other. And if you marry properly, you grow deeper in love with time, but infatuation gradually fades away and it's replaced by a deeper more beautiful love in my opinion and so a lot of time but it, then it comes with work right and it's same thing with a, a company the bigger and more successful you get the more work it's going to be the more liability you have the more considerations that you have to have and it's just a lot of times entrepreneurs yearn for those early years because it's the infatuation googly-eyed puppy eyes stage True. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, Ryan, like, honestly, I feel like we should just dig deeper into, sure. um, we can always do a second show where we actually talk about real estate, but I mean, I think this mindset, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I could talk all day about how to unpack everything that society has told us and whatnot. Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, I say we just dig down deeper into that. Sure. And I mean, I'd like to hear, 
more about um, what it was that drove you to start reading those books. I remember that as the son of a college professor, I've always been pro-education and I recall seeing a lot of these like coaches, right? Oh, you follow my step-by-step process and you'll have this or you'll be that, you'll be rich or you'll be super likable or whatever. I remember talking to one of these coaches and in so many words, what I walked away with was, because I, I, I was like, how did you get to this point where you're literally coaching someone? We're so good at your field that you're coaching someone. And his answer was 10,000 hours, basically. I did hours and hours of this, hours and hours of that. I was in the field, constantly testing, tweaking, this and the other thing. What I realized in that moment is it's not, he doesn't have a step-by-step plan. That's ridiculous. That doesn't exist. What he has was a ton of time in the field. Now, if I follow his step-by-step plan, will I get there a little bit faster and flatten the learning curve? Oh, absolutely. However, you can't get to the master by taking shortcuts. You have to put in that time. Sure, you can flatten the learning curve somewhat, but truth be told, you have to put in an immense amount of time. You have to make huge bets on yourself. You have to make sacrifices. The word sacrifice means (laughs) to give up something valuable to you in the hopes that you get something else more valuable. So it's not even a guarantee. A sacrifice is not even a guarantee. A sacrifice is not by definition pleasant. It is really hard. So what are some of the um, bets that you've made on yourself? And sacrifices, like some of those those pivotal stories or, or just whatever comes to mind. Biggest one I've ever made was signing recourse debt on my mobile home parks with millions of dollars over my head if the mortgage didn't get paid, cutting my expenses, cutting my salary over over half, losing all my benefits, 401k, all that jazz to literally go and sleep on a blow up mattress in a double wide. That was the biggest bet I've ever made for myself. And the reason why we've spent 10, 20 minutes talking about the psychology of this, because the question, so when I interview folks who've done similar things, they speak very nonchalantly about this stuff. Um, And I think the reason why it's important to, to make note of that is because I don't want people to listen in and walk away going, oh yeah, whatever, he just moved into a mobile home park. That's how he did it. No, it took me years to have to develop fear management because it's not just, it's not that I'm, I'm not scared. That is absolutely patently false. I am very scared. Even today when I buy mobile home parks, I get scared. Um, it, it's not that I don't have fear. It's like, oh yeah, that's the next logical step. No, there's a lot of doubt that clouds your mind. There are a lot of, even my own wife came onto my podcast and just lambasted me when we were starting out. She was describing how we were starting out and it was really hard on our marriage. It was really hard on me, but I had that conviction because I spent years learning the psychology and also learning the asset class. So I knew like David Tepper, owner of the Carolina Panthers says, I knew what a strategic risk was i'd done my research and i was ready to make that bet and along the way there's constant sacrifice there's constant bets i have to place on myself i am very public about this for the longest time i've only paid myself thirty-five thousand dollars a year pre-tax and i have banked the rest on purpose so when you move into a mobile home you realize what actually makes you happy because you really don't have anything else (laughs) <laughs> and you realize that a lot of things you've been spending your time and money on don't really, they actually don't really make you that happy. And when you strip away all of those comforts and then slowly build it back up when you finally, cause I've finally started increasing my salary because I feel like I'm close to enough financially, um, which is another conversation in and of itself. But yeah, I mean, between moving into a mobile home, between being hour, four plus hours away from friends and family in my hometown, it was in Atlanta, Georgia, which is about four hours away from Charlotte. I mean, I basically was like, I'm going all in on this. I'm 30 years old. I was 30 years old at the time. I'm 30. I'm going all in. I'm like a poker player, 
all I'm betting all my chips on this. And again, it's it's not like I don't want people to hear that and go, oh yeah, whatever, you know, it, I could do that too. I want you to hear, yes, you could do that too, but oh my gosh. <laughs> It took literally years of education, listening to audiobooks, just like you did, reading books, all of you listening to podcasts, talking to people. It took all of that to be able to develop the mental fortitude to not let my own limiting beliefs and fear get in my own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's just absolutely incredible. I think it's important to talk about that it is hard and sacrifice is you know, it's, it's important. I, I personally lived with, I mean, I did house hacking. I lived with roommates until a year ago. I'm 36 years old. I had roommates until a year ago because I was just so committed to house hacking. And, um, and I mean, we still have Airbnbs on our property. Like we still basically share our property with other people, but it's like, um, having that, I mean, I don't feel like it's hard now, but it, it was hard actually. Like it was hard to make that choice. Cause I didn't have to do it, but I felt like it was really an important process, you know, to get where I wanted to be and to continue growing the real estate business. So it's not easy folks, but it's possible. And if you have that vision, why did you choose real estate, Ryan? So I'm going to try to condense a lot more because there's a lot of really cool topics that I know you really want to get us to, (laughs) but with a lot of introspection, So when I was reading and I was beating out these convictions I had in my mind, I also thought back about what I enjoyed as a kid. And there were just things that keep coming to mind as a child that I really liked. I really liked the game Monopoly. I really liked the the computer game The Sims. I really liked the computer game SimCity. There are a lot of real estate themes in all of those games. And so one thing you can do, and I can't remember who I got this from, but they were like, you should really look back on your childhood because you didn't have the responsibilities you have as an adult and your convictions and and everything haven't been built up yet. So in other words, you gravitated towards things that actually really made you happy because you didn't have to worry about money. So I just spent a lot of time thinking about what I liked as a kid. And then with my MBA master's in business, I got to see a little bit of everything. And I got to see that while I really liked operations, I really hated warehousing and inventory. And I was like, real estate sounds pretty good because I have a really limited amount of inventory. It's limited resource. So I don't have to worry about selling milk or perishables or you know, should I have, how many warehouses should I have do all these calculations per square foot and travel time and all that jazz. So real estate, again, also took years and years and years. And it wasn't until I read rich dad, poor dad, where I went, that's it. That's what I meant to do. Awesome. Yeah. I, um, I think that's, it's super important to just, I, I really like how you put all those pieces together and then something just kind of dropped. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, Ryan, I also want to hear, you know, I know we're running short on time. So, um, what would you say is something that you want to leave the listeners with? I know we've touched on like the mindset stuff and, um, is there anything else you want to share before we start to close up? Yeah, I'd say the number one and number two reasons why people don't buy real estate or at least don't get full-time in whatever they want to get, even if it's not real estate And even why people plateau, it it boils down to two things. You have a faulty strategy or you lack visionary underwriting. So what I mean by that, first and foremost, if if you read a book or listen to a podcast and go, I want to do that strategy. And then you go out and try to do that exact strategy. Guess what? That's not your strategy. It's not unique and different. You need to find a unique and different strategy. And you can't be a choosy beggar. If you think you're going to buy mobile home parks at a 10 cap and you refuse to look anything at less than a 10 cap and you don't pull national reports that say the average mobile home park trades for about a six cap, which is not even close to a 10 cap, you ain't buying a mobile home park. So in other words, you have to, you have to be honest with yourself about what the market is telling you. You have to develop a unique play that's differentiated that's based off of what you enjoy and you're passionate about. And then from that foundation, 
you can start to underwrite with more vision. And I don't mean that you're good academically at doing the math. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to understand and have vision about how you can cut costs and raise revenues, how you can scale a business, how you can find economies of scale. That vision has to be in your underwriting. And again, all of this is based off of the however many minutes we spend talking about mindset because it'd be really easy to be like wow ryan hasn't syndicated a single deal but yet he found his way into 20 mobile home parks and he didn't know any millionaires six years ago he knew no i knew no one i mean it was embarrassing to be quite frank so how did i do it i made really big bets based off of quite literally years of trying to understand who i am what i was passionate about because i'm not that talented i'm not that smart i'm just that brutally honest with myself and patient to find something I love, like truly love. And that maintains that consistency. And that brutal honesty allows me to do some really cool things that most people aren't doing. So again, I don't want people to listen and be like, oh, that's a really cool story. No, like I'm going to sell you guys vegetables right now, not (laughs) candy. I'm going to tell you what it really takes. Yeah. Um, Don't, interpret my nonchalant like oh i just you know i just moved into a mobile home park no oh my god so much went into that Mm -hmm. yeah for sure um well that's really awesome ryan we'll definitely have to have you back and um, talk more about you know the nuts and bolts of it but you know we could obviously talk for mindset of about on like a series of podcasts. So anyways, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'd love to shine the spotlight on you. Tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you and anything else you'd like to share. My name is Ryan Narus. It's spelled N-A-R-U-S. That's N like nurse. And like Tupac used to say, I ain't hard to find. I believe I'm the only Ryan Narus in the world. If you Google me, my LinkedIn comes up, my website comes up. Feel free to email me. I don't care who you are unemployed and broke or the CEO of a fortune 500 company, I will talk to you. I thoroughly enjoy helping others and don't need anything in return. If I can help you get where you're going, by all means, reach out to me. I would love to help you. Awesome. All right, everyone. Well, there you have it. You have a way to contact Brian. We'll make sure it's in the show notes. Thank you so much. We can't wait to have you on next time. Bye, Ryan. Bye. Thanks.